Hello, I'm Anthony. This is the seventh video from the series called Paint. And today we are looking at glazing for the second time, part two. We'll look a little bit closer at the technique of glazing, especially looking at the technical part, the colors, and how to use the colors, how to choose the colors, I'll give some hints from the past and just to begin uh, from this very good book, it's in Italian, uh, talking about glazing. Uh, the Egyptians used glazings, that's for sure. You can see the glazing in uh, different um, areas. Plinio talks about uh, glazing uh, when he uh, talks about color. Egg tempera. Uh, Romans used blues, greens, lake colors, blacks. Uh, on a preparation of uh, uh, burnt sienna. We have a lot of history, this type of painting. Uh, some very very famous painters and then uh, talking about the actual colors okay we have uh, some favorite colors between painters that uh, have used this technique um, as I mentioned before the burnt sienna rose garanza cobalt blue Prussia Van Dyke brown uh, Avorio black. These are colors that tend to be already transparent, so they have a very, very uh, powerful use in painting. And so we're going to look at uh, these kind of colors. Okay, there. When you buy uh, a tube of paint, you can find some information about the paint on the uh, label permanent orange and on the back here it says that it is semi-opaque semi-opaque it's problematic when you use it for glazing Here's another brand, this is Rembrandt, and they also have a marking up here. You can see the different markings, and here is a square that is divided in half diagonally. So this means that it's semi-opaque, so it's similar to this. This is a scarlet red, scarlet red, and... Uh, this is from Windsor Newton. Windsor Newton, it's a manganese. And also here on the back, you can see the square is completely white. So this is a transparent color. And this is manganese. So this is highly recommended for the use of glazing. Here's another Rembrandt uh, sap green, and oh, let's see that this is uh, okay. Sap green, and you can see the uh, the rectangle is white, so that's transparent. Now, if you buy online. This is a website from Michael Harding, and I'm just looking at the colors here. You can sort of see, just looking, that you can see that this green lake is, is quite transparent. Uh, you see that there's a big difference between the white. There's a lot of white. Also, this thalo cyanine cyanine green is quite transparent it's very very strong 
uh, the umber is tra transparent and these uh, Naples for example is not very transparent at all you see there's not much difference and if you go and you look at the color you'll actually see that the transparency is opaque so they tell you about that they tell you that the color is opaque uh, on the other hand if you use this phthalo cyanine green you'll see that it's very transparent so this is a good color for using glazes other brands uh, Williamsburg also they have their uh, online colors and in a way you can see but not so well here this alizarin yellow you see that there's a little bit of opaque a little bit of transparency here Indian yellow for example is very very transparent you see that they will list that uh, that uh, the color is transparent and so when you choose if you're choosing for uh, glazing uh, avoid the opaque colors because they're they're problematic they're problematic they don't really allow complete transparency uh, here's Rembrandt this is another brand that I use uh, you saw some of my examples uh, this you can see is very transparent it's uh, the color is coming through here and if you look at the information you see here the it's actually semi-transparent it's semi-transparent which is okay uh, as a yellow probably the better yellow to use well, cadmium, they're not very transparent, these colors. They're all semi-transparent. Um, yeah, lemon yellow. And, ah, still the green. Yes, this, this is uh, very transparent. You see it's transparent here. And in fact, we will use this color here. So you can buy your paints already transparent. This is a good hint on looking for transparent colors just for this purpose okay you can buy opaque colors for other reasons uh, sometimes the under painting you can use an opaque color there's no problem with that but they're a little bit problematic now I wanted to just look also at some examples so that you could understand a little bit better here's here's a painter Paolo Potter these are from the National Gallery and you know if you can see paintings really up close you know you can start to see and understand how this type of painting works you see remember we we worked with the white we tried to get the white as much as possible so here's the white and then you have some different transparent colors over the top and you can see that the underpainting is orange a little bit orange or an earth color here you can't see it because the white is built up and so solid and you can see the different uh, glazes that are over the top this being a blue glaze then here he's using a little bit of a rose color uh, just to give you know that uh, difference of the tone and here a violet uh, these are all done with glazes and uh, he's quite quite a good painter uh, Paolo Potter with uh, with the glazes he, uh, you can study these paintings for uh, the quality uh, you see the sky again this blue glaze over the warm underpainting uh, the white resists even more the orange and so any kind of glaze here is going to really come out it's a little bit rose colored and so they really bounce out the the clouds really come out very beautiful very delicate uh, Titian uh, is very well known for his uh, glazing 
you see the skin color the glaze uh, being more here's the white opaque and there's a lot of different glazes here probably red uh, some violet a little bit of yellow you can see in the in the dark uh, you know the non highlighted area there's almost like a violet color that's uh, defining the uh, the mus muscles and uh, then he uses a kind of an outline a warm outline uh, you can see the glaze here probably a uh, very very um, warm background but glazing over with the blue uh, very very uh, the skin tones here look at the look at the skin tones here from from a distance you 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 can see uh, all of the anatomy that uh, is used here the scapula scapula the the uh, the deep muscles in the back and and if you go close enough you can you can see that these were just you know hinted at with whites and then the glazes over the top there's more of a rose color in the highlight just a little bit more of a cool bluish color in the um, dark areas again he he used a outline a warm outline and then a little bit of uh, idea for the uh, volume here you see this rose glaze over the top uh, rose a little bit of yellow and uh, you can see all of the underpainting here is uh, he was a master of uh, using these colors and also in the red the reds are usually you know you can see very well how he used the glaze here uh, for that and uh, yeah well I just wanted to say one more thing about the stand oil using the glazes uh, you need stand oil Linseed oil is runny. It's more difficult to use for glazing. Stand oil uh, is a oil that is treated. It's um, polymized, and so it's a more bodied oil. It's heated. So you have, uh, here's a very good website, Natural Pigments. They talk about the uh, refined and uh, raw oil, different oils that you can buy here these are all very very good for uh, the idea of glazing its uh, uh, products that you use so the main idea is the stand oil then the transparent color uh, the color choices there are many many transparent colors so it's a matter of choice what colors you like what what you find successful how you how you can use these colors in the way that uh, you feel free with using them okay the state of the painting is here and I see too much red and not enough yellow so today I'm going to glaze with some yellow I have this color still the grand yellow which is a kind of a greenish yellow here and uh, then I have the uh, raw sienna raw sienna which is here it's an earth color that has a lot of yellow and then uh, yellow ochre which is here and so I'm just going to mix those the color uh, by just putting a little bit you know a little just a little dab of it right here you see and then taking it off I can see you know, how much yellow. Yeah, I would say that that's probably going to be okay.
Okay, now I've taken two blues here. This is the ultramarine blue. And this is Prussian, Prussian blue. So you have Prussian and ultramarine. Then I have some alizarin crimson here. And I've mixed, this is the 100% with the yellow. And this is now the 50% that I just put some stand oil in. So I'm going to glaze the hair again. Trying to make a little more definition.
I just wanted to say a few words about the Kabbalah and this phase. And in order to understand a little bit better, I'd like to show a graphic which will help me to explain a little bit the, uh, the idea that I want to express. Okay, this is the ten sefirot, sefirot, and those I've mentioned this word. It's also known as the tree of life, and we have ten different sefirot. We've talked about Keter and Chokma and Bina. We've seen these uh, three names. Now we're going to talk about Zer Ampin, which is considered a phase that is really six different sefirot under a kind of an umbrella name of Tiferet. And then the last phase we'll talk about um, Malkut. So the top part, the part that uh, we identify as the root phase, uh, Keter, Einsof, we saw in the video about inspiration. And this phase is the total light. It's all the light and it's the start of the creation. It's also referred to as the Behenat Shoresh. And from this total light, we have the light of Chokmah, which illuminates the vessel, the Kli of the first phase. This is Behena Aleph, and it's called Chokmah uh, as a sephira that we saw on the first slide. And we have the will to receive. It's also referred to as a first expansion. And this is the idea of the surface. Chokma, we have inspiration to surface. It's the vessel that is within the light. Only the will to receive. It's uh, the step of the formation of the vessel. Like in the painting, it's the formation of the surface. You decide how big it's going to be, what color. The second phase is the Behena Bet. Uh, it's also called Bina. And here you can see that there is Or Hasidim, the light of Hasidim, that actually surfaces from Chokmah. It, it comes, it was in Chokmah because everything is in Keter, but it's surfacing. So we have this uh, will to bestow that is a first intensification. The will to bestow, the will to give. And this is a very special step because in giving we realize that there is a creator and we desire to become like the creator. It's the awareness of bestowal and so it's an awakening. So now uh, we are going to uh, clearly look at the third phase which is called also Behina Gimel. Uh, Shorest is the root, Aleph is the first letter, Bet, second letter Gimel is the third, it could be corresponding with A, B, C. So this is the third, third phase, C. It's called Zer Ampin. And it's the will to receive coming again. So the Or Hasidim, the will to bestow, leaves way for Or Hakma, the light of Hakma, which is the light, uh, the will to receive, come back into the vessel. So Or Hakma comes back into the vessel and in this phase we are looking at the idea of glazing. So this is the, the third phase, uh, the rediscovery of Hokma, the will to bestow coming again. Hasidim becomes less and so the will to receive is less. Consequently the will to bestow balances with this will it's receiving in a new way, 
with understanding of the new awakening of Chokmah, together with the light of Hasidim. And so these first phases, uh, we can talk about uh, intensification and um, uh, expansion, right? So, so this Chokmah is an expansion, while in the second phase you are intensifying the light. The light becomes more intense. The uh, third is the second expansion. That's why we're comparing it to Chokmah, the light of Chokmah. And then finally in the, the fourth, there is a second intensification that we'll talk about, the Malkut. So here in this first phase, it's total expansion of or Chokmah. And the second phase is uh, expansion with the light of Hasidim. Talking about the will to receive, the will to uh, bestow, uh, it's very important that you understand that these are vessels. The vessels are also called Kli, and they are uh, filled with light. And that's what you are doing in the painting phases. You're creating a vessel and you're filling it with different kinds of light. And I'm just corresponding the different kind of lights to the corresponding nature in the Kabbalah. The painter initiates the creation in pure light to receive. So this uh, first phase, the root phase, the inspiration in the surface, completely the will to receive, the first expansion. You're just doing this to receive and doing it to initiate something that is coming to you. In the second part, you have the will to bestow. So this is the, the Kli is filled with a particular kind of light, the light that bestows, that's very similar to the Creator. It's uh, contentment, you are making contentment on the Maker. And then the act of creation is uh, the starting again of the, uh, the last phase, phase three, where you are receiving again. And all I can say here is that in the act of glazing, there is a giving and a taking, a giving and a taking. The artist is more aware of the final product because the, the actual painting is coming to the end. So major changes are made here. And so there's this you know, I'm, I'm looking at it, I'm receiving something, and then I'm deciding, okay, I, I, I have to go back to do this, I have to do this more. There's this dialogue between the artist and the work of art in this third phase that is, is very complicated, very complex. And uh, uh, I'm using the idea of glazing in this, in this video to capture the idea that uh, this, this phase is complicated, but it finishes. And so we have, in the end, the end of the third phase, which will give way to the fourth phase, which we'll see next time. So that's the idea of where we stand in Kabbalistic terms, okay?